talk about one of my favorite subjects of my experience with August Wilson. Um, let me begin um, by kind of setting the scene for where August and I grew up and the kind of world and the kind of society we grew into. How's the volume in the back? Is it, can you hear okay? Okay. Um, we were born in the, and raised in the Lower Hill District. Um, I was raised on the corner of Epiphany and Fullerton Street. Some of you may remember that area. Um, Epiphany was just a couple blocks down from the famed Fulton and Wiley intersection. Um, quite as well known as Forbes and Murray <laughs> in its own time. Um, we came up at a time when many of the people who um, the Hill District was in great transition <coughs> and the um, Hill District was being increasingly populated by refugees from the South and from Southern segregation and Jim Crow and Klan terror. And at the same time, um, we came along at a time when many men and women were coming back from World War II and developing a new framework on how we were going to live in the United States. Um, and the African American community in the Hill District around that time was a community that had developed a very rich cultural heritage and was surrounded by people who esteemed their cultural heritage. One of my fondest memories of growing up in the Lower Hill District was when my parents would take me to Logan Street. Who knows Logan Street? Logan Street, I thought, was just one big amusement park. <laughs> you heard the chickens in the wooden cages cackling, and there was all kind of stuff on the sidewalks. These stores now, these trendy stores are all have these sidewalk cafes. They think they're doing something original. <laughs> Everything was on the sidewalk. There was cheese hanging from in strings and all kinds of activity, all kinds of noise and music and people, all kinds of smells and Logan Street was just a wonderful place um, to be as a child uh, when I was coming up. My mother had 12 children. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, she <laughs> <laughs> so we had a large family and she did housework. She did, she was a cleaning lady. And she got a job um, cleaning for a Catholic church. She was the housekeeper for the rectory and the convent at a church called Holy Trinity. 
church there on the corner of, of Center Avenue and Fullerton. Today it's called St. Benedict. And because my mother worked there, she was able to get her children to attend school there um, without tuition. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to go. It was not easy going to Holy Trinity School when you were in my neighborhood because the kids made fun of us. You go to that school that has the weird people. <laughs> they have women dressed in these long black robes and they look mean. <laughs> and the men, they call all the men father, and none of them have any children. <laughs> That's a weird place you go to. And they're all white. I said, yeah, but we get a good education. And we're able to complete our sentences and punctuate. That was our comeback. <laughs> that, was, that was all we could do. <laughs> That's where I met August Wilson. August um, and I attended uh, Holy Trinity Elementary School. And while we played rough games and wrestled and ran and played tag, August was a retiring kid. He, he wasn't a part of all of that rough house play. Um, he was on the side always. But he was always watching. He didn't participate the way we participated. The way he participated was to watch and smile. And in class, he would never volunteer to raise his hand to answer a question. But when the teacher called on him, he always knew the answer. I could never understand that. Because the few times when I did know an answer, my hand was waving, <laughs> waving. He could read before any of us. He was very bright and Rumor has it that he even did some of the homework for some of us. <laughs> um, his name was Freddie Kettle, and my name was Sam Howes at the time. The ingenious Lower Hill District relocation, urban redevelopment plan of the 1950s and early 60s that relocated and dislocated 8,000 families and organizations and churches um, separated us. And I lost track of uh, August. And we went to public housing up on Francis Street um, up near Shenley Heights and that's where I finished my elementary school days at St. Richard's um, School um, and eventually went on to become a young man and decided to drop out of college and, not drop out, I, the plan was to take the summer and go to Mississippi as a freedom rider for four months of the summer and then return to college to finish college. It turns out that four months turned into four years. And when I came back to Pittsburgh, 
I was a kind of a community organizing veteran since I had learned community organizing in the South, in the Mississippi Delta, um, under the tutelage of people like Martin Luther King and Fannie Lou Hamer and Lawrence Giot and all of those civil rights heroes that you know well. So when I got back to Pittsburgh in 69, I went right to work. There was a lot of work to be done and I was ready to do it. And that's when I ran into Freddie Kettle again. But he was August now. <laughs> and he was still shy, but a little bit more forthcoming. He had to be in order to read his poetry. Um, and he was a budding poet at the time. Um, so we came from a, um, a community that produced a lot of cultural product. There were more jazz, world-class jazz aficionados from Pittsburgh than from any other city our size. We had more than we deserved. And we had a city that supported two Negro League baseball teams when many cities our size had none. And one of the teams had a stadium, a baseball field, upon Bedford Avenue near Chauncey. So writing and theater and sports and music at a high level was an environment that we um, we grew up in, um, as well as the memory that our parents and grandparents had of the brutality of the South. And so you will see many of those reflections in the work that August Wilson produced when he talks about the Hill District and the people who came to the Hill District from the South and the values and the culture um, that they brought with them. And he didn't hide the blemishes that are found in any people. And he didn't polish up and change the way we behaved or the way we talked or the way we dressed. He just reproduced that on stage and said, that has cultural validity. It doesn't need to be changed. It just needs to be presented. And that's the material of the plays that he came to to learn how to write. In the 60s, we discovered, as we were organizing political meetings around police brutality and meetings to improve the housing conditions and improve, improve education and health care services, etc., we discovered that theater was a powerful educational tool to organize people, to mobilize people, to educate people. People would sit and watch a play for two hours, but they weren't going to listen to me speak for two hours. So 
when we wrapped our message in drama and entertainment, it was more palatable and people were able to absorb it. And so the poetry soon turned into theater. And August's poetry eventually became plays as he became a playwright. And we formed a theater in 69 called the Black Horizons Theater. Our home theater was in a school auditorium in the Hill District that the principal let us use and make, make that our home theater, A. Leo Wild School. Um, and that was, that was a very, very rich uh, experience. Myself, Rob Penny, August Wilson, Curtis Porter, some others were founders of the Black Horizons Theater. One other thing that um, I used to really enjoy doing is having lunch meetings with August and Rob Penny. And we would meet frequently to talk about different characters in the plays um, or new play ideas or plays that we were working on. And we always met at a restaurant on Wiley Avenue. Um, we called the restaurant Pan Fried Fish. The reason why we had to give it a name is because the restaurant was owned by two of the most ornery brothers <laughs> you have ever seen. Why they decided to go into a people business, I don't know. They didn't like serving food. They didn't like people. They wouldn't even give the restaurant a name. They just put a sign in the window that said, Pan Fried Fish. And so we made that the name of the restaurant. We'll meet you at three of Pan Fried Fish. And that became our spot. He didn't care how long we sat and talked and laughed and drank coffee and smoked cigarettes. As long as we started by ordering a fish sandwich and some coffee, we could stay there for as long as we liked. If we were going to meet at three, August, when we got there, would have already been there. And he wasn't at Pan Fried Fish. He was next door at a jitney station. He would be sitting on the floor with a pad in his hand, laughing at the men, telling their stories and their lies about their athletic prowess when they were young or what they did in the war or their exploits with women <laughs> and the troubles with their wives and their kids and August found all of this just absolutely fascinating. Um, and so if Rob or I got to pan fried fish and August wasn't in there, we automatically went next door because we knew that's where he was. And we'd get him and bring him back over to pan fried fish to start our meeting. So when in 1982, August came back to Pittsburgh on one of his many visits, August had left Pittsburgh in 1977 to go to Twin Cities um, because the community there 
was much more welcoming of artists and they had funds to develop budding playwrights and artists and so a lot of playwrights came from all over the country to the Twin Cities to develop their craft because it was supported by the foundation community there. So August heard about it and went there, but he came back often and uh, would be telling us, you know, the different plays he was working on and the characters he was developing. And then when he came back once in 82, we got together and he said, I'm ready. I'm ready to put on my first Pittsburgh play in Pittsburgh. I've kind of workshopped it around and I, I, I think it's ready. I said, okay. So what's the name of it? Jitney. 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 <laughs> but it took place in pan fried fish. <laughs> the setting for Jitney is a Jitney station next door to a restaurant that sells fish sandwiches. And I said, of course. <laughs> That's the name of it. And he did me the high honor of saying the entire time I was developing the character, the lead character who is the uh, owner of the Jitney Station, a guy named Jim Becker. Um, I had you in mind. And um, by that time, I had stopped acting because uh, I had been doing it for so long um, throughout the late 60s and much of the 70s. So we're now in 82, and I'm not acting anymore. But when August said he was ready to put his first play up, and it was called Jitney, and we talked about what it was about, I said, of course, count me in. And we did this play in the Allegheny Repertory Theater. It was a converted church. Some of you may remember this church that had been converted into a theater down on Kraft Avenue between Forbes and Fifth. This little church there. And that's where we did um, Jitney. Soon after that, of course, August blew up. Um, he was invited to workshop at Yale. Um, and the people at Yale saw the unique talent that he had um, for writing and crafting and putting together a play. And they took him under their wing. And soon Ma Rainey was born. Who said Ma Rainey? Yeah. I thought that was first. And they workshopped Ma Rainey around the country, and he would tweak it and tweak it and tweak it until it had worked its way back to Broadway. And once Broadway got a look at August Wilson, they said, this is something special. This is something special. And even though you write much of your work about this place called the Hill District in this town called Pittsburgh, the fact that we don't know the names of those characters or the names of the streets doesn't matter. There's a universal message here that we can all relate to and other people will relate to it and it will sell tickets, and it will make money, and you'll be a big star. <laughs> and that's what happened. So many of the works that, many of the plays that August had 
in his works. He had learned from other playwrights that he had studied to write about what you know. Write about your experience. Don't try to create some foreign, different experience from way on the other side of the world. Write about your world and make that authentic. And so he had a number of plays that he was working on that took place in the Hill District. And he figured out that placing them in 10-year increments was a very effective way of telling the story of how the African-American community of Pittsburgh, and therefore the African-American community throughout the nation, how it developed and what the obstacles and triumphs were to its development. And so before you knew it, he was writing plays for each decade of the 20th century. So he didn't discover the power of this before he started writing plays. He discovered it through his playwriting and then went back and made them sequential with Jim of the Ocean taking place in 1901 and then coming on forward um, with the other 10 plays all the way until Radio Golf, um, which took place in the 1990s. Um, I won't bore you with all of the awards that August accumulated. You probably know them better than I do. All the New York Drama Critics uh, Awards, um, the Pulitzer Prizes. He won two Pulitzer Prizes for drama. Um, most playwrights hunger for just one Pulitzer. August had two. One for fences and one for piano lessons. And of course the list goes on and on and on of the, the awards that he won um, for all the plays that made history. Um, then we get to a sad part of my story when August discovers that he's sick and that he's dying and he, he wanted to make sure two things, that his daughter would be secure and well taken care of. And he made all of his friends promise to be her uncles and to make sure we keep an eye on her. Uh, but they're all the way out in Seattle, so I have to keep an eye on her through Facebook. <laughs> and she knows I'm watching, so she better watch what she says on Facebook. And he wanted to complete the cycle of plays um, Radio Golf was being workshopped in Los Angeles and he got to the point where he couldn't travel anymore. Um, but he continued to work on the play through conference calls um, and sending runners back and forth between Seattle and um, 
Los Angeles until just before his death when radio golf was finally completed and ready uh, to go to Broadway. I got a call from Constanza, um, his wife, and she told me that, um, Sal, you will not be surprised to know that August planned out his whole funeral. I said, no, I would not be surprised <laughs> to learn that. And he wants you to have a major role in arranging the funeral. I said, uh-oh, Costanza. What, what do I have to do? She said, he wants the funeral to be at St. Paul's Cathedral in Oakland. And after the funeral, he wants to have the funeral procession drive through the Hill District and pass by all the important landmarks and places where we hung out, go by pan-fried fish <laughs> and the Jitney Station and Eddie's Restaurant and Aunt Esther's house, Aleo Wild School. You know all the places where he would want to go if he were on his last tour of the Hill District. And I said, okay. Um, by the way, the funeral at St. Paul's Cathedral, um, he doesn't want mass said. <laughs> he has already invited the guy who did all of the musical scoring for all of his Broadway plays to arrange the music. All of the actors that um, had done his work on Broadway James Earl Jones, Rob Dutton, Felicia Rashad, all of them had assignments for what they were going to read at the funeral. Um, and then there was another surprise that I didn't learn about um, until uh, I was on stage introducing the various acts. But I called Bishop Whirl and said, Bishop, um, August Wilson is on his deathbed. And one of his final requests is for the funeral to take place at St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, he was aware of our background in the Catholic school system and in the Catholic church. And he said, nothing would please me more. If there's anything already scheduled there, I'll see if I can rearrange it and we can get the funeral scheduled uh, for the main um, altar at the cathedral. And um, I would be glad to do a holy high mass of, at his funeral. I said, well, thank you, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> August said he didn't want mass. <laughs> <laughs> no mass. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, Councilman, but if there's not going to be a mass, there can't be a funeral at the cathedral. And I said, Bishop, is this something maybe you can sleep on? <laughs> he said, no. I don't have to sleep on this one. If there's no mass, there's no funeral. And 
And so I went back to Constanza and said, well, can we do the Mass and then have the program after the Mass? He said, no, August already knew that was coming. <laughs> no Mass. I said, well, we can't do it at the cathedral. She said, I thought that might uh, be a place. Well, I'll leave it to you to find a suitable location. And so that's when we went to Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall. And at the end of the funeral program, um, much to my surprise, I heard a trumpet backstage that started to play Danny Boy. And that just brought the house down. And as the Danny Boy tune um, started to draw to a close, the trumpet player came out from behind the curtain. It was Wynton Marsalis. <laughs> and he went right from Danny Boy to when the saints go marching in. <laughs> Boy, did we have a good time <laughs> at the close of that funeral. And we marched out to our cars and got in the funeral procession and took August on his last tour of the Hill District, then took him out to the cemetery <coughs> um, where he rests today at Greenwood Cemetery. That's my August story. I was working on, at the time, developing a cultural center um, and museum as we had planned it. It was going to be the African American Museum. But after August passed, everybody knew that we had to name this the August Wilson Center. And we got his wife's permission to name it. There is no other cultural center in the country bearing his name. There's only one other edifice in the country bearing his name, and that's the August Wilson Theater in New York on 52nd Street. Um, so we are proud to have his name associated with the August Wilson Center for African American Art and Culture. And his name being attached to it keeps us on our toes, lifting up the quality of the work that we present in that center um, to the kind of standards he would demand if he were directing this as a play. So we're proud of the August Wilson Center, and we hope if you haven't visited, uh, you will visit the August Wilson Center um, and enjoy what we, how many people have been to the August Wilson Center? Fantastic, wonderful. Please keep coming back. There's always something new um, to be presented there at the August Wilson Center. I just, this past weekend, we attended an event uh, that Sean Jones and the Pittsburgh Jazz Orchestra put together in honor of another Pittsburgh great, Art Blakey. Um, and we had Art Blakey and Roger Humphreys and uh, James Johnson. And it was just a bunch of wonderful drummers. Uh, it was just a great show. High quality theater, high quality art, high quality um, building, and um, 
and I'm honored to have been associated with the start and establishment of the August Wilson Center for African American Art and Culture. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, ma'am. I attended the funeral and you would have gotten an A plus. You would have been pleased and what impressed me most. There were no research that anybody could come. Everyone was walking forward. Yes. yes, if they had kept the ugly out, I couldn't have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I have a challenge for you and a question. Okay. In the beginning of your talk, you said Wally Avenue in Fullerton was like Murray and uh, Center in Fullerton. It was like Murray Heavenly Board. I, did, I was born and raised on Protectory Place, <laughs> right next to us. So I challenge that statement. <laughs> okay. I'll <laughs> take that. The other thing I want to know is I've seen a couple of displays. And um, as you know, the Bailey Hotel was right on the corner of... Uh, Actually, I think it was on the corner of Protectory Place and Center. And that's where I saw all the famous celebrity, black celebrities that came to town. A friend of mine, his parents had a grocery store across the street, and we used to sit on a bench. I can remember seeing Joe Lewis. But I never remember him saying anything about the Baby Hotel in any of his uh, plays. I, I just couldn't figure it out because the Baby Hotel was like... The Baby this. Hotel came down before our time, and it closed before our time. The, when we came up, by the time we were aware of Hill District Hotels, it was the Ellis Hotel that we were most familiar with. The Bailey Hotel by that time was closed and perhaps even demolished. So I know the history you're referring to, but it wasn't a part of our growing up. We're not quite that old. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. I, thought, um, I don't know if you're, are you a contemporary of George Benson? Yes, George used to play his guitar right there on the corner. I'm sorry, of Fullerton yeah. and Wiley. Their <laughs> <laughs> Goods Drugstore. Because my father was, he was a choir instructor at Epiphany Church. This would have been like the late 50s, early 60s. Yes. I know that George Benson was one of his students. Yes. So I wonder if you were one of his students. His name was Mr. Sullivan, Lawrence Sullivan. No. Yeah. No. But George and I are still close friends. We call him Georgie. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, I grew up in the Hill District, too. And uh, uh, August Wilson came to give a talk at Pitt some time ago. I forget how many years now, uh, and uh, at that time he said that, I believe he said he went to McKelvey's school. He went to several before. schools. Oh, oh, okay. Because I told, when he, he did talk there, I went up to talk to him about my growing up there before you and he did. Yes. <laughs> I think when he left Holy Trinity, he went to McKelvey. Oh, that's when. And, uh, but I also told him that I had read a couple of his plays and I'd seen a couple. And I was wondering, and I'll ask the same question to you, did you not have any interaction with so much of a part of the hill that was the hill in those days? And that is the immigration uh, of so many of the European people who had come, so many of them, and there was just an intervening between the coming of the African Americans. And that was that would have been true for and many. He told me, no, I told him I I didn't. I saw that not much was mentioned in his works, and he said no, there wasn't much yeah. interaction. During his time. That's exactly the point. Um, there would have been more interaction among the adults. 
than among yes. us children. By the time we were coming into adulthood, the transition in the Hill District had for the most part taken place and it was almost all African American by the time we became teenagers. Yes. What took the family out to Seattle? Um, that's where August's new wife lived. It was a woman. <laughs> she lived in Seattle. We wanted to be with her. And he also found Seattle to be um, a place that supported his creative juices. You know Seattle is a beautiful area, it's so lush and green. And Seattle also, August said, in many ways reminded him of the Hill District. Did he write any plays about that area? No. His plays were about the Hill District. Yes, sir. Um, he left for Minneapolis and then Seattle, and then he wrote the Pittsburgh plays. Did he need to come back and hang around to replenish, or was everything by then in, in his head? He could came back to replenish frequently. And I cherished the times when he came back because they always had great wild stories <laughs> to tell us about his exploits. And so he found coming back to Pittsburgh not only replenished his work, but it also made it okay for him to have left. He felt a lot, he was very conflicted about having left the place that he was writing about and, and putting on Broadway. Um, but he had left. And um, so coming back frequently was a way of making that okay. Yes, sir. What's the reason he changed his name and how did he select the August Wilson as the name? Um, what he said, uh, at the time when many of us were changing our names, I changed my name from Sam House to Saladuddin, and Muhammad Ali changed his name, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar changed his name, and so many changed their names as a way, as a part of our cultural development. Um, part of shedding the slave past was changing our slave names, we said. Uh, but for August, the twist that he put on it was that he wanted to take part of his father's name and part of his mother's name and make that his name. So his father's name was August. His mother's name was Wilson. So he changed Freddie Kettle to August Wilson. He experimented with a lot of different variations of names and settled on August Wilson. That's what it was. Yes. Are there walking tours? Of yes. Wilson's yeah. Lower yes. Hill. Uh, yes. His niece does a number of walking tours. Um, you may have um, seen some of her artistic work. She goes by the name of Dr. Goddess. Um, um, August's oldest sister, Frida, had um, a daughter, and they still live in the house on Bedford Avenue where August's mother, Daisy Wilson, last lived. And um, she does a lot of history. And she teaches at the University of Pittsburgh and does a lot of theatrical work. And she does a lot of tours. And there are other tours that uh, a number of other people do. Now, how do you arrange this? Or... Um, I would suggest that you just Google Dr. Goddess. There's only one. <laughs> and contact 
expect her and she'll be glad to arrange it to her. Yes, ma'am. I have an odd little question regarding August Wilson's name. Um, I'll give you a little background. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered about this. In the Frick Building some years ago, I met a lovely man who had grown up with August Wilson's sister. And I don't remember if he knew August or not. Uh, but he said that he pronounced his name August Wilson. Is there any truth to that? I mean, well, I think that would have been the way his father, his father pronounced it. But as long as I've known him, it's been August. But with that pronunciation, it actually means wise. Mm -hmm. August is wise. Oh, good. Cool, thank you. Other questions? I'm just yes. curious, you said something about touring the Hill District. Mm -hmm. what, what's left? Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, yeah. You haven't been there in a while. The lower end is gone. Well, no, yeah, the lower end is gone. Yeah. But yeah. for people who are familiar with August Wilson's plays and the uh -huh. places that he writes about in his plays, From most of them you. are further above Crawford Street. Yeah. And those are the places where the tours would take place. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you again for having me. We will see you in three weeks. We don't have as big a gap. Thank you very much for coming.